you're okay. I really will use my just if it okay. I will use it then. ATM for wishes, by the way, that's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, Ben Jacobs, CEO and co-founder of Whistle. Um, Whistle is the first company using wearable smart technology to take better care of your pets. So I always start uh, with a little market research. Who has a dog in the room? Raise your hand. Okay, put them down. Who knows someone who has a dog in the room? Raise your hand. <laughs> Second degree, we're everyone. And raise your hand if you've heard of Whistle. I was wanting to just get a sense of awareness before you saw this makeup up last. <laughs> okay, that's pretty good. It's obviously a tech early adopter audience, but we'll take it. Um, this is, you know, where we want to go with everyone who gets a whistle, or if you give it to a dog owner, or if you care about your own dog. And I'm gonna spend a lot of tonight trying to tell you the journey that we got to the very first step, maybe, of getting us there. And we're certainly not even anywhere close to where we want to be. But if we can have these kind of magical moments with folks, um, then we've won. So here on just a second. And the reason is we, we love our own dogs. I'll tell you guys about the journey. I mean, we've spent a lot of today. I really want to get through my slides in 20, 25 minutes and spend most of the time just answering questions or having more of a dialogue because I'm sure I can learn far more from you all than you can from me. Um, but I do want to give you a sense of how we started the company, why we started the company. Um, how we got from these blue AA powered data loggers that we velcroed on the dog collars to what we have today, how we today launched National Alien Pet Smart, which we're super excited about, um, and, and just give you a sense of, kind of what that process has been for us. But again, it's just our two cents. So at the end of every section, I'll give you my takeaways, but again, it's just one person's opinion. So. These stats might blow some of your minds. For those of you who have dogs, you probably spend well over $10,000 if you live in San Francisco and own a dog. Um, it's a really, really highly emotional market. In the US, there's over 80 million dogs. There's more dogs than kids. And we spend over $60 billion on them every single year. Um, so it's this extraordinary market, and yet no one has built a brand in this space around smart products. There's incredible companies like Fitbit doing this in health for humans. There's great companies like Nest, we'll talk about doing this in the home, and yet there's been no one who's taken a lens at Petco and PetSmart and thought about how they can bring this kind of intelligence to that space. And that's really a core thesis for us. So before I even get into Whistle, <coughs> I wanted to give you a sense of how I think about where we are, because we're in a really strange time. And I put this together because we're at an Internet of Things meetup, and you made a joke from Fitbit about startups that haven't gone so well. There are a lot of products right now. <coughs> um, and I really hope for everyone in this room that everyone can build products that can be sustaining, whether that's a small business sustaining and you sell some units through great retailers like Grand Street or big brands like Fitbit. But there's simply too many products. Our thesis is that there's going to be a few major brands that do emerge. And these brands are going to be very consistent in a few ways. They're going to focus on a high value vertical. What I mean by that is there are great niche offerings for small verticals that you can certainly build products for. You just can't sell a lot of them. And the reality is in consumer electronics, to build a good business, you have to sell a lot of consumer electronics. Um, a lot, a lot, a lot. That's just the nature of the business. So you have to focus on a high value vertical. In our, our perspective, and it seems to be everyone's perspective these days, but design has to come first and foremost. And design of everything from the packaging, to the product experience, to the advertising, to the end cap, it all matters. Um, I think the third one is often overlooked, which is creating habits. You can build great toy companies if you sell millions of units, but if people stop using them, they're not gonna be valuable, certainly venture-backed businesses. Um, you need to create habits to continue that engagement. You have to win in the right channel, and I'll talk a lot about this today. Why are we in PetSmart first versus in Amazon, or Apple Store, or Best Buy? And then finally, this is something we haven't proved yet. I think Fitbit's done a great job with Aria. I think Nest did a great job with their Protect. But you have to leverage your core offering into additional products and services that are of value to the consumer. Um, so a few, I'm embarrassed now that I don't have Fitbit in here. But I do have a few that I want to just quickly hit on. Jawbone, I think, has done an incredible job across three product lines. But their unique insight was that lifestyle and design matter. Quick, uh, just anecdote, but I know Alice is here, who's a great PR person for anyone who's going to look at their launch or for Indiegogo or whatever you want to use. Alice is amazing. Jawbone, interesting anecdote, from day one, had both a design PR firm and a tech PR firm. 
So they realized from the outset that as a company, we have to be a design brand like a Gucci as much as we have to be a tech company like an Apple. My personal favorite, because I grew up surfing, and we have a GoPro engineer here. Uh, <laughs> I think for me, of the five I mentioned, GoPro's unique insight was actually Channel. Um, they built a great product, timing was really interesting, Contour was there though too, there are other products. GoPro owned an enthusiast channel, and I mean that in a couple ways. Yes, they sold in surf stores and ski shops, but the way they activated surfers and skiers is unlike anything I've ever seen. And it's created such a base for them that now when they go public and they tell the street they're a content company, people really believe it, but they believe it because you see these on every single mountain in Tahoe and don't see contours or any other camera anymore. Um, and I think that's largely a channel story, it's obviously great engineering and product and a lot of ops behind it as well with those accessories. And then of course, a $3 billion darling of recent. Um, <laughs> I always say this is a bit of a unicorn, and so I don't tell any entrepreneur to take this one as a guiding light for them because you're not Tony Fidel, um, and neither am I. Uh, but there's a lot of instructive lessons you can take about how they built that business, um, as well as, in my opinion, how they decided what not to build first. Um, the fact they started the thermostat, the sensors they left out of the thermostat, the sensors they left in the thermostat and didn't tell you about, it was a very, very interesting strategic rollout. Um, and I think certainly enabled the acquisition by Google. Which I'm still disappointed they didn't go into that. <laughs> I'm excited to see the new event. And so Whistle's goal is to bring that exact same type of design, experience, and channel insights into the pet industry. So here's what my buddy Adam and other folks who are organizing this asked me to talk about today. Um, and so I threw some quick slides together, but again, they're really just talking points. So how do we conceive of the problem? Why are we here? Remarkably, it wasn't just us saying, if it's cool, we'll do that for dogs. So I'll tell you about that in a second. Prototyping and design journey, and I'm happy afterward, anyone can come up and see the prototypes I brought. We're pretty open about this stuff once products are on market. Um, manufacturing and supplier selection, I lived in China for a long time, so I have to talk about that too. Um, not for this business, but it's come in handy. Uh, and then retail strategy execution, why PetSmart? What are we doing with PetSmart? Because, you know, retailers are just about fulfilling demand, they're also about creating demand. If you work with retailers as partners, they'll help you in that journey. So, why did we, uh, why this business? If I can't get puppies into a slideshow, then. Um, so, yeah, very personal story. I, uh, I grew up with German Shepherds, and that's why I put German puppies up here. Uh, I love dogs, I've always had dogs my whole life. I had one of these, Guy sadly passed away when he was only five. And for any of you who have dogs, it's a really hard experience. I mean, Germans should live to 10 or 12, not 15, but five is very young. Um, it was one of those experiences where it felt like he was healthy and then he wasn't, and then you're at the vet and then you're putting him down, and I didn't have insurance, like many folks probably. In the, oh, actually, out of the, raise your hand again for dogs. This is a little bit of longer term market research for us. Raise, keep your hand raised if you have pet insurance. Used to, there you go. I have cat insurance. <laughs> you have a cat, that's your first problem. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. It's a big mark, we'll get to cats. We'll get to cats eventually. Um, the ratio is actually pretty high, so San Francisco shows we're a bit willing, more willing to spend even on things like discretionary insurance. Um, I didn't have insurance at the time, and a lot of Americans don't have insurance. You spend um, 5,000 bucks, or you just can't afford it, you put your dog in. This was a few years back, you know, and it wasn't a time when we could actually build this. And the remarkable thing about what you all are building now, um, whether it's a mood ring that actually tells your moods or whatever else, you couldn't do this a decade ago. Um, and that was certainly true at the time that Bear passed away, but it kept with me. And then as I met my co-founder, C was here tonight, and our other co-founder, Kevin, who I'll show in a bit, um, we all kept talking about this, and we thought there must be a way to solve this problem by providing new information. It's effectively, the first problem was, tell me when to go to the vet. Uh, how, when should I go to the vet? And when I get there, what the heck should I ask the vet to do? Because you're pretty much flying blind, your dog can't speak, and the vet will often tell you it's a thousand bucks to leave blood work, but you don't know what's gonna happen. Um, that evolved, and I'll talk about that, but that's, that's where we started, and certainly is still the mission of the company. <coughs> For the first time last week, um, caught a dog who had a kidney infection, and the owner saw it through whistle, um, through a higher period of rest than they would have noticed themselves, saved the dog's life, and that's, really the goal of the company. So that's exciting. And that's, I think, the absolute only thing you need to take away from this is build something you really care about, not in some market that you don't 
or if you think is important or you think is a trend. The second really important part though is work with people you trust and respect. And it helps, this is the second part of this slide, if you happen to have backgrounds that enable you to build the specific business you're attacking. So that's me and my current dog, Do. That's a pretty Instagram hipster photo of Steve with his dog. And that's our other co-founder, Kevin, who is a cat person. So we will go after cats. Um, and I think almost ignoring the second half of this slide, I wouldn't have built Whistle without those two people. And if for those of you who are entrepreneurs building it alone, I have a ton of respect for you. I don't know how you do it. For me, I couldn't do it. Um, I think team's the most important thing if you're at the seed or founding stage and trying to figure out who you want to work with. Um, this was just sort of a nice benefit. Uh, Steve and I had experience working with Dell and consumer electronics. Kevin's a brilliant firmware engineer who ran many products at Sierra Wireless, focused on 4G, 3G, different wireless bands. And so, you know, my takeaways are if you can get that third bullet, it's nice to have prior experience, whether it's engineering or network or channel. I don't actually think it's a necessity because I've had so many friends banging down doors and build businesses that didn't have that in. But I think the first two, I would highly recommend. And if you're staring in the mirror some days and you're really tired because this is a really hard, long journey, and the first bullet doesn't apply to you, get out of Dodge. <coughs> get out of Dodge immediately. Um, and that's one thing Steve and I said from day one is if we don't care about this space, if it won't be important to us, if we wouldn't use the product ourselves, even if we don't sell any other products, then we shouldn't do this business. Um, prototyping. So this was the, uh, before we built anything, because we didn't build this, we paid for this. This is a blue data logger from a small company called Gulf Coast Data Logging, in the East Coast. The lesson here is test the heck out of your idea before you build anything. Um, there's many ways to do that today. Crowdfunding, if someone from Indiegogo here is an absolutely amazing way to do that. I think Indiegogo and Kickstarter and self-funding or self-crowdfunding is an incredible market research tool unless it's a funding tool. Um, I highly recommend that. Uh, for us, we were able to get a lot of strangers and folks to even pay and use these blue data loggers to see data on their dogs. But we didn't start industrial design, start thinking about what product we were going to build. I'll tell you a bit about some features we learned through this process without first giving ugly USB sticks, effectively, that are AA powered. The, to get very tactical, the product experience was we would mail you this. We'd send two AA batteries. You'd send it back to us. And then we'd get the data manually. And then we send it back to you via email in very ugly graphics. And what we were trying to do here, before we invested capital or spending of our own time going further in this specific product, was is there a there there? If there's not a there there, you shouldn't build the product. The interesting thing on Indiegogo and Kickstarter is you actually can't really tell if there's a there there from a product experience perspective. You can actually absolutely test the demand. Does someone want a game console or a wearable or what have you, but they won't be able to use the product. What was fun for us was we learned a lot about the actual product experience. Which is people love their dogs. I mean, a level above this, people really love their dogs. Um, they love the data. So they went nuts when they got their email, and they started to manually themselves go back and say, oh, this was when the dog was at the kennel. This was when my dog was with my sister. This is when my dog was with a dog walker, and this is when I took him to the vet. Um, so I did a lot. But they made it very clear that this would not be a value to them if they couldn't see it from wherever they were. And we'll talk about some engineering implications of that because we have to include Wi-Fi as well as Bluetooth today because unfortunately there's not a lot of hubs in the home for us to get data otherwise. So remote monitor is a key feature. This is probably a yeah duh for all of you who are building <laughs> not powered wearables. But battery life is really important and there's some subtleties to it. Telling me when my battery is charged, telling me my battery needs to be charged a day or two early if it's on a dog collar is pretty important. And then there was a lot of design feedback that influenced our ID. Primarily, build something I'd want to put on my dog. You know, it's just like I buy Apple products, I buy Fitbit products. Don't give me something that's ugly just because the category today is ugly. Um, and yeah, we started ugly like this. <laughs> so this was one of our first industrial designs. Um, we worked with New Deal Design, who's great, works with Fitbit and Lightro Camera and Slingbox and a number of folks. They were a great partner of ours. Um, ended up somewhere we're really happy with, um, but if it's any uh, double E's or even better antenna designers in the room, so that's metal, and for those of you who have ever dealt with metal, that's a really fun, thanks Scotty at New Deal that we have a metal cap on our Faraday cage. So we had to figure out how to fit all of our components as well as you know two silicon chips that are sharing the same antenna, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, to go through that. Um, my main takeaway here, I, I would never lie to you guys, I can't do this. 
Um, we have an incredibly brilliant, humble, funny director of hardware who joined us from Lab 126. Um, and the only way I can give you is this takes team, it takes time. And you have to hire the right people. We could not have gotten this product out in its current ID without David individually, and then without his broader network of folks. Um, and you're also gonna have to have patience because it takes a lot of red when it comes to antennas. Um, the other thing I was gonna say, just uh, this is made to be a, a product, but don't overlook brand. These logos are horrible. These are really bad. You guys should be laughing because they're awful. So we got to a place we like, but I think a lot of people overlook that in consumer, it might not matter if you're building smart grid or enterprise, but if you're in consumer, don't overlook other parts of design. It's not just product. People are very spoiled by Cupertino and they expect you to think about all of these elements. So make sure you're thinking about all these elements. It's not just good enough to put a product out in the air. Um, and then the last thing for me again, not just in terms of data, data throwing, but it comes back to your team, whether your team is two or your team is 10 or your team is 20. Um, that's what's gonna make differentiated value for your business. Um, and frankly, gonna make your business survive or not for those first year, two years, three years. Okay, so theoretically at this page, you've, you've got to a product that you at least are vaguely happy with, you're hopefully past prototype, you're starting to enter EBC, DBT, maybe you're already working with a supplier, and by the way, if I throw out terms like EBT, DBT, feel free to raise your hand if you don't know what those are. Um, okay, engineering validation. And so basically it's a process in manufacturing where you're doing either design validation or engineering validation. You're gonna be able to build these products in volume. Because you can build a prototype of anything. Or you can build one mood ring of anything, but can you build a million mood rings? And so you go through many, many processes. Lab 126 will go through many EBTs and DBTs before a Kindle comes out. And a startup will typically go through several as well. Um, and so we're at that stage where we're about to go into that real volume manufacturing. Even if that's a first thousand units for your Indiegogo Kickstarter, or ten thousand units for Indiegogo, or if you're going into hundred thousand units for a national retailer, um, you're at a different stage of the business. So, how do we do that? I think I took away all personally identifiable information from this. I certainly hope so. Um, <coughs> you need to go really deep on who your manufacturing partner is going to be. So above here, there are some names and some locations. We look through dozens of potential factories across many continents. Uh, almost all startups should do this. They don't all do this. I'm not saying you can always afford to do this, but I would highly recommend that you know who your manufacturer is versus working with a broker. You can work with a broker. I think there's really great things going on at PCH or Riverwood and other solutions that are helping you with these. But make sure you as the business also own some relationship with that manufacturing partner because as I talk about at the end, it's not just how you select them and send them a design and you're good. It's going to be a very long um, and arduous relationship, but potentially a really great partnership if they invest and you invest in it. Um, and so here's just an example of kind of how deep we went into it. Got a little levity. You do need to go. It might not be China for you. It might be Korea. It might be Tijuana. It might be Guadalajara. But you need to go to where your facility is. And that doesn't that isn't as expensive as it sounds. It's a plane plane. That's all it is. I mean, get on a plane and go. Do not manufacture if you've not seen your manufacturing facility. I have seen so many first-time entrepreneurs do that with hardware, and it's insane. This is your product, and this is your business. If you don't know where it's made, and you personally, I don't mean someone else, get on a plane and go see it. Um, and then once you see it, you know we actually went pretty in deep with six factories, in part because we were doing some price negotiations, but really because they have very different capabilities. Um, you want to put them on a grid, and you might be surprised, but if you're not Fitbit or GoPro, that's a really, really important part of it. Or even if you were Fitbit and GoPro five, six years ago, they're not all actually going to want your business. Even if they say they want your business, you need to make sure they actually want your business. Because you can have a great tier one CM, and if they don't care about you, they're far worse than a tier three CM if you're their prize golden goose. And so be careful about being a very small fish in a very big pond. How do you tell if they're not in interested in you if they in fact are saying they are? What's this, so yeah, it's a great question. The simplest thing is honestly, who was on the tour with you when you went to China? Is it the head of the factory? Is it the head of the company? Are you actually meeting the engineers who are guaranteed to be on your project? So on every volume manufacturing line, you're gonna have a quality engineer, mechanical engineer, test engineer. You should meet the ones that are gonna be, and if they look like they're 14, 15, <coughs> instead of you know, 10, 15 years in the factory, you're not in good shape. Um, if you have two sales folks who barely, everyone, you know, in every one of these factories, there's someone who speaks really good English. If they're not there with you, and you're in America, and unless you speak Chinese or Spanish, or whatever language you're in, um, that's that's a good indicator. And then afterward, I mean, look at how aggressively they're following up. Are they trying to provide value to their business? We had um, 
I ended up being actually not the, the first supplier we uh, worked with, although someone was working with us something else. Um, sent us several designs saying, yeah, you guys have this cool ultrasonic welding way to make your device waterproof. Our device is submersible, it's fully waterproof because dogs swim. And they sent us three other options. That shows that they're investing, <coughs> but at no cost to us. That shows they're investing their engineering dollars in us, and it's a real indicator they want the business. Um, F was a bad factory, whoever they were. Um, but you can't just end it here. So you sign a contract, first of all, is, uh, I'm skipping this whole negotiation of what are your flexibility tables and what are your terms and who's buying the components and who actually owns the plastic, you know, the steel tools, the plastic. But it's boring for most of you probably. If you want to talk about it, we can. I think the main takeaway is then you have to keep going back. It's not just like, okay, now I'm done and you make the product and I'll see you in a year. We have folks in China all the time. And more importantly, generally they like us. We try to take them out for Chinese New Year, like this was from a month ago with a few of our folks there. Um, you want to build relationships not only with the managers and the senior engineers on your line, but also with the direct line operators. It's really, really important. Bring t-shirts, bring stickers, as silly as it sounds. Could you speak a bit more about the, the design capability piece of your contract manufacturer? Is it just designed for manufacturing, or is it something else? Great question. Yeah, and a fantastic question I should have led with. So for Whistle, um, Again, and we aspire to be kind of nice, you know, like GoPro and Fitbit, who early on in their history certainly lean a little bit more than manufacturing. We lean a little bit, but we do have a full-time Mechie. We have a full-time E. We have four firmware folks. I mean, obviously, I mentioned we did industrial design here in San Francisco. So a lot of our capabilities were in-house. Now, we lean on them for design for manufacturing, and so specifically mechanicals. Ultrasonic welding is a great example. Has anyone dealt with USW before? You're all so lucky. It's a horrible process if anyone's a mechanical engineer effectively gluing two plastic pieces together with ultrasonic waves. It's horrible, it sounds horrible. Um, we lean on them a lot for very, very refined mechanical changes to our plastic parts in that process because they know how to build in volume better than we do. But from a design perspective, and this is in part because of the design capabilities I was talking about, we see that as core to our business. And so we wouldn't outsource that. Um, now, it depends what your product is. If you're building, a very basic camera, for example. Um, there's a lot of factories that can ODM that product pretty well, and you give them a pretty basic ID, and they can probably make it. But if you're building a small form factor device like ours, or that necklace, I imagine, you're probably gonna wanna control a lot more of the process, because the necklace, the aesthetics are gonna matter so much if you're, if you're calling it jewelry. And that's how we thought about it. Um, so for us, it's primarily a CM versus an ODM relationship. And you There's sort of at this point. Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. So this was this an iterative process that you found out for your manufacturing? Like, what was the sort of fail that you had like that? Oh my god. Yeah. Actually, I don't know if I brought any crazy failures. Um, we had so before we got to ultrasonic welding, just to give that example, because I'm on it. We started with heat staking. Heat staking is a really good process in terms of manufacturing and volume, although it's very messy, and more importantly, it's very hard to get to full IPX7. So you can get to water resistance with heat staking, but it's much harder to get to waterproofing. Okay. So that's an example just tactically of mechanical. Like any product, we went through several revs, both on mechanical as electrical, Dave's pretty brilliant, so we were able to get through pretty quick. But um, you're, gonna, you're gonna go through some pains. I think the most important thing is for you to have a realistic schedule and understand whether that's about capital, like actual finances, or it's just time. You're not gonna get it right the first time, and that's okay. Um, I would say our manufacturing partner helped with some of that, but really a lot of that was on our team, and that's just in part the way we built the organization. There's definitely stories I've heard where they had no mechanical or electrical and have something entirely on their, on their ODM. Um, oh yeah. Um, so during your prototype, how did you figure out what like false positive and false negative cases based on data? Because you know, especially when it comes to something or someone who's alive, it's pretty difficult. You know? so. Do you mean in terms of like getting back to the product itself, like what we tell you as an owner? Yeah, yeah, because I don't know what your inputs are. But yeah, 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 and I should probably have a slide here, I don't, because I was just focused on manufacturing, which is about the actual ad and the product. The product is far more today, at least what we're exposed to the consumer, health and wellness based. Um, it is get, get outside, make sure you guys enough exercise and rest, and some dogs actually get over exercise, frankly. Um, for their breed, weight, and age. The example I gave of her finding a kidney infection was the rest actually went through the roof and we sent a notification. So we weren't diagnosing the problem, and that's really important for us. It depends, there's a lot of folks in IoT attacking healthcare directly. We're definitely not. We're trying to enable healthcare, 
because we can never be a veterinarian. I don't want to replace the vet. But we want to alert someone like, hey, if there's something really off here, it doesn't seem driven by you because we know who's around the dog via Bluetooth. The dog's just resting more. Um, maybe it's worth going to the vet. That's exactly what you did. So it's still an ongoing issue for us, and we're doing studies. I would say issue. It's, a, it's an opportunity. It's a, it's a challenge. We're, for example, right now with a research institution, let's say we can detect epilepsy with a whistle. That's really exciting. If you're a dog owner, you, of course, would want to know if your dog's epileptic. And for dog owners who know their dog is epileptic, it's even more impactful because they don't know when to medicate their animal. They don't know the severity and the frequency of their seizures. Um, I don't know if we'll ever put that in the front. Even though we know that, I don't know if we'll ever put it in the front. No, I yeah. understand that. But yeah. would, would you build models around the data you already have to oh, see okay. some sort of yeah, correlation yeah, yeah. in future? Absolutely. So from like a super basic, for, well, it's not basic, but uh, we have a data scientist who's a PhD and spends a ton of time focused purely on machine learning algorithms, looking to identify specific accelerometer footprints as walk or play or rest or a seizure. In the case of us versus a job went up or a misfit shine or a fuel band or a Fitbit, our advantage is that dogs aren't really shaking their heads unpredictably, like I am right now, versus a run. And so we can actually, with pretty good accuracy, see if a dog's going to walk on a leash, for example, if it's on his neck. Um, and so yeah, we, we did a lot of that. And actually, with the blue data loggers, we had owners manually log the dog's activity. I, I took them for a walk on park, I took them for a leash, in the second phase of that. And even today, we have folks who are in a effectively closed beta doing that. And the researchers, whether they're looking at epilepsy or orthopedics, do the exact same thing. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, last one from me, and then happy to go into any of this, or uh, obviously hear from you all. So retail. So we, you know, we had a product. Uh, as we were ramping the product, you know, we were a bit unique, but I'll try to frame it in a bigger, bigger context. Pet is a fascinating industry. Uh, I've spent time in pet. Uh, in terms of business, and PetSmart and Petco still control a lot of the spend. I don't know for you pet owners if you do shop PetSmart and Petco, but they still control roughly two thirds of the dollars in terms of non foods and non grocery when you're at Whole Foods picking up food or you're at Safeway. Um, I'd say a more important and a real challenge for a lot of Internet of Things companies or fancy device companies uh, in other channels, PetSmart and Petco are highly experiential, vertically integrated channels. What I mean by that is you go with your kids on a Saturday morning, adopt a dog, go to a groomer, go to a veterinarian. These are all in the same retail environment. So you spend an hour plus inside of Petco and PetSmart. And at Best Buy, you're in and out and really annoyed, or you go for a minute and you see a TV and you order on Amazon. And what's challenging about that is if you don't have the <coughs> great GoPro display with the HD video playing, you won't capture the attention among the million other wearables inside of Best Buy. And so an opportunity for us, and this is I think a lot of the excitement from our initial investors, and fortunately now is, is coming true, is that PetSmart and Petco, we look far more unique. And I was just talking to another investor who was talking, who was saying that GoPro should this best. They proved that you can sell consumer electronics in a surf shop. Well, we're trying to do the same thing in selling consumer electronics in a pet store. But what that means is that right now in every single PetSmart in the country, all of the associates know what Whistle is. Most of them have downloaded the Whistle app on their iPhone or Android phone and are super excited to show it to someone, even if they don't have a dog or whistle themselves. The reason is there's no other great products like Automatic or small companies that are all trying to fight for the same Apple Store Best Buy Associates tension. Um, and so that was a huge advantage for us. You know, we wanted to prove that out. We did a lot of research to make sure that our core consumers cared about the pet store channel and were influenced by the pet store channel. So what you'll see here is that not only do I con convert there, but it's the veterinarian in a large pet supply chain, which is a proxy for PetSmart and Petco, um, that actually influences my purchase behavior. So this was our target. And my design director who joined us from Google will kill me for taking this iPhone snapshot before this meetup. But this is how uh, the end cap ended up. We're pretty happy with it. And I also brought an independent retail example for a veterinarian office and wants to see what these look like. Um, Position in store means a lot. If you're able to get into retail, don't let them put you on the bottom of the shelf in the back of the store. You might as well not go. I mean, it, it's just, especially if you're a startup who doesn't have broader awareness and no one's going to look for you, you need to hit a consumer in the face. And so for us, we're fortunate to be, this is the second end cap in all pet smarts. Um, it was really important to be able to have that moment with them. And then in addition to that, you want to make sure you're doing all sorts of marketing. And by the way, look how unique and strange we look next to cat food. But that's on purpose. We want to look unique and strange. You can't miss the iPhone 
when you're next to cat food. <laughs> and that's really important. This shows again that we will stand out in this store. And we do these kind of things across the board. We launched a fun Tales and Trails city guide. You can, this is whistle.com slash Tales and Trails. And if you're in you know, these five cities, you can find fun dog parks and dog restaurants for you. If you find a retailer that's committed to you, they'll partner like this. Best Buy, and we love them, we hope to be in them soon, but they'll never do this for us because there's so many other vendors to think about. And so you need to make sure for you, what's unique about your product? What's a unique space for you? You know, for Ness, they really stood out in Lowe's and Home Depot in a pretty big way in terms of design. For GoPro, it was surf and skate shops. For us, it's pet. Um, you know, it, for, I'm not, the name just me. who did Jawbone buy for $100 million, the other hardware company? Someone in this room must know. Body media. Body media. There you go. Leave it to the PR professional. Um, so body, <laughs> body media, uh, <coughs> or brand awareness with body media. Body media, I think, great company. They built their whole brand um, in Weight Watchers. A lot of people don't know that. They built that was all in that channel. So a very specific channel. Now, obviously, human health wearables, weight loss wearables, got mainstream. But at the time, that was a pretty unique channel insight for them. Um, so find something about your product. Um, and then build lasting partnerships. You want to have, just like I talked about manufacturing, you want to make sure they're behind your product and you have executive level relationships. Um, so we know the whole C-suite has results, for example. Yeah. So what did you do as far as sort of retail expertise? So you had to bring someone in your team or contract it out to somebody. Somehow you have to get in. From what I've heard, that's a very sort of complicated relationship driven space. It's definitely relationship driven. It's a great question. Um, so I was lucky in that regard. Uh, when I, one of our clients at Bing, I can't say which one, but it's one of the national pet retailers. And we knew the other ones because Bain Cap had made an investment. So I had some relationships, but I never sold a product in that. I'd never been a professional vendor. So we got our first foot in the door, and Steve and I flew to Phoenix and San Diego where these vendors are and pitched them as just founders for the team of 10. A few months later, six months later, we actually had the product and we're shipping to pre order consumers. We're ready to ramp in this way. We did bring on a VP of sales internally, and he joined us from Pet Food. And that's probably really surprising to a lot of you, but his relationships are so valuable because of exactly what you said. He ran a brand called Wellness Pet Food that some of you might know, it's a billion dollar pet brand. And he brought them from Pet Independent into PetSmart, into Petco, into Amazon, into Whole Foods. Um, and so, yeah, for, for bringing him on was purely about the relationships and also about just executing a national launch at this scale in a PetSmart. Uh, question going back to your previous topic about manufacturing. Have you, what's your opinion on manufacturing in South Bay as opposed to China, maybe for early prototypes or small scale? Have you seen it work? Did you do any of that? Yeah, great question. I absolutely have seen it work. Um, we did do some of that. I wouldn't say we did any production units there, but we certainly ran build. Our manufacturing partner is Global, the one we selected off of that grid, and so they have facilities around the world, including one in the South Bay. And we do use that facility for manufacturing test runs. Um, now we actually use it for some RMA and so forth. So um, I highly recommend that. In the, it, it really is so dependent upon your product, so I don't want to speak in general, but from in generalities, up to the 1,000 products a month range, I think once you get beyond that, it just doesn't make sense financially, unless you really, really don't care about gross margin on your hardware, which you might not. I mean, there are folks that I know who have business models that are different. If you don't want to make money in your hardware, you can build it here. But today, for small form factor consumer electronics, like yours, jewelry, I would say you want to probably go overseas. I'm guessing for that, if it's Bluetooth, probably China. Mm -hmm. There's just so much runway there and logistics there. Um, so I, I, you didn't mention it, but just I know you personally, uh, that you had a period of sort of pre-orders on your own site, and then sales that were happening, you know, you just uh, mm -hmm. announced PetSmart today. Um, you talk about the timing of why that was now and sort of like, w was, <coughs> was this a strategic plan or was it like, let's get in PetSmart as soon as we can and this is just when it happened? No, no, it's definitely part of the plan. Um, and I, everyone I think who's built products in volume will tell you this, they told us this and we thankfully listened to them. Ship some product to consumers who are direct because they're going to be so generous with you in terms of their feedback and in terms of their patience. Um, we did that. We learned a few things. We refined our attachment a little bit. We changed the iOS app, which we actually announced today as well, and released that. Um, you're just going to learn something. We are fortunate, touch wood, to not have major failures, but there are companies that can absolutely survive and <coughs> see major failures on a small end, and then can fix those before they go into national retail. But it's far worse if you don't feel buttoned up going to the national retail partner, which we do now. In terms of when we announce the PetSmart, that's, certain, that's more of a question for Alex. It's, it's a PR choice. 
We decided to announce it because we wanted to drive a lot of traffic towards PetSmart when it's actually in stores versus some folks will announce coming to Best Buy in three months or coming to PetSmart from an Apple store. We already had a good amount of, or some PR, I'd like more, but uh, we had summer media and so I felt like you know, we can hold this bullet, let's announce it when it'll be on all stores as of Monday. They're doing all the planograms right now, so. So that's it for me. I mean, you know, for us, this is really our goal. We see this as a lasting brand. Um, we really believe that we should be able to sell you pet food, but should we sell you electronics in space? We admire brands like Purina. Um, that's how we think about our company and what we'd love to build. Um, and so one last slide that wasn't asked for, get a whistle for all of you who have a dog. Um, and seriously, if you do love dogs and like working on really hard problems, there's very interesting data problems we have. Quad pedal movement is different than bipedal movement, so we can't use folks like Motion X. Um, and we'd love to talk. Uh, shoot me a note, or if you just want to shoot me a note in general, it's ben at whistle.com. So thanks a bunch for listening, and uh, happy to answer anything else. Sure. No, I'll go this way. You had uh, Mars Pet Care up on uh, one of the earlier slides yeah. somewhat where your relationship were. I'm so curious since like, Mars is, I used to work for, for one of the divisions and they're pretty closely held and, and not huge on partnerships. What was your relationship? Yeah, with? yeah. So Mars may or may not be a band client and announce that on the record, but in a smaller area that things we have. And um, they're a really great partner in terms of innovation and pet. They're the largest, for <coughs> those of you who don't know, Mars, yes, owns m and They're also the largest pet food company in the world. So and one of the largest veterinarian hospitals yeah. in the world. And they own Banfield, yeah, which is co-owned by PetSmart. And so there's a real triangle strategy I didn't go into here where we'd love you to go to a PetSmart, buy a whistle, go into Banfield and get that visit and have that connection with your pet. And maybe you buy Mars Nutro pet food or not. Um, we ultimately was a very informal relationship to answer your question directly. We started out just kind of having some advisors. The former uh, president of Mars North America became an investor because he believed in the space and where pet health is going. Um, I think we'll start to see the fruits of some of those relationships later with partnership with Banfield. Yeah. I'll see the question. Yeah. Um, can you share a little bit about what your marketing strategy is today? Yeah, great question. So. Michael, you want to share a little bit about our marketing strategy? <laughs> sure, if you want. Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, so a lot of it's going to be, uh, in, sorry, can I look at everyone? We want to get a lot of data back from our customers. We think customers will drive the long-term value, whether it's peer-to-peer -peer marketing, whether it's you walk up to someone in a park and they say, what's all that on your dog color? And they're gushing about whistle versus like, oh yeah, it's kind of something I look at. But um, we're doing a lot of experiments, I think. Right now we're so early as far as the brand awareness, the experimentation of different verticals, of different strategies, willing to take risks as long as they're small risks, and then find wins and then scale those wins. So there's definitely a data-driven approach to marketing, but it's also um, listening to customers has been, uh, I think Rashika, who's our community manager and talks to people on social all the time, has actually driven like some of our messaging. This remote monitoring piece of it has built so many stories that are like emotional, but also in the core of the product. So I think those are the kind of things that will drive our long-term marketing is what our customers say and then how do we drive those messages to make it ubiquitous. So I don't know. Yeah, no, well. So well, how do you quantify it? Because it would be very subjective feedback, right? Well, quantify it in terms of, of the customer feedback. Yeah, because if you want to drive your product through it, you'll, you'll need some number. Well, sure, but in which way do you want to quantify it? Is so, this your like, site, sales? There's I a would, lot of different metrics. To yeah, quantify. well, a customer can say, I would really love this feature, but how much they want to pay for it? And That's a great I, And how, how long they're going to wait the, for the it? The market risk of how much more people are willing to... Uh, I'll give you an example. There were, if we didn't have Wi-Fi in fact, you couldn't have remote monitoring. How valuable is that to people? Is it $20? Is it $40? I think the market will dictate and demand will dictate that. Right? There's a lot of other questions about, hey, waterproof, right? How can we not build this product to waterproof? But like as Ben made a great point, if it wasn't waterproof, how many customers would you lose that take their dog in water? So like there's decisions that have to be made, but when I say feedback, it's more about what features they like, what features they would like to see, and what parts of the app keep that sticking. As Ben talked about habit forming, one of the biggest fears of, I think, IoT is people stop using the device. Mm -hmm. like it's a fatigue thing. We want to build these habits where and add features that even after they've checked comparing to other dogs, they're looking at other data points that make this really exciting. So they're checking five different features a day. 
and I mean, we're really proud of our engagement rates, but we think they're even going to get even higher. So, I mean, that's a that's a great data point of like, is the product getting better? Are we keeping that engagement level even beyond the early adopters? But does that really translate into revenue? Uh, or I you hope so. If people love the product, you're going to grow. And if people use the product, you're going to grow. If someone says, oh, I used it for two months, which I own a fuel van, and I have tons of friends that say, I used it for three months, and I was over it, and I stopped wearing it. I think, um, yeah, Michael's spot on. I mean, that, that's what grows a sustaining business. So, and I'm not in any way, so I think there's been a ton of sustaining business built on Indiegogo and Kickstarter as well. But I would not mistake initial product sales for long-term product engagement, and therefore a sustaining business. So I think that Michael's right in terms of long term. Short term, we do a lot of PR. We try to get as much our media as we can and get included in as much as we can. And then I really would say, you know, in a limited budget scenario, which we are, even though we're venture funded, we've raised just under 10 million and so forth, you still, you're not like a big player like a drop cam who can now buy millions in ads and you know, in Jawbone and so forth. Lean on your partners. For us, it's a retailer. We'll be in a TV ad with PetSmart, and that's, we're not paying for that. Um, but it's a PetSmart ad with a few products, and PetSmart does radio and supports to drive their own store sales. I was, I promise I go left to right, sorry. Yeah, so um, in the earlier days when you were kind of bootstrapping and testing the data logger, uh, what techniques did you use to get um, your first customers, the early adopter customers? Like how did you drive traffic yeah. to get those first customers? Avoid your friends and family because they will never tell you the truth. Yeah. So um, we use Craigslist a lot. Um, we use meetups actually, it's funny, I'm a meetup, uh, dog meetups. Uh, we definitely, we don't want to go. We didn't want to skew too hard to dog enthusiasts, but we were willing to be like, "Okay, if you're crazy, let's put a Velcro blue thing on your dog." We just want to get some feedback, but just make sure they're strangers. Ideally, you can get someone to pay you to do that research because it shows they're so interested in this novel idea. But that doesn't apply to all businesses. <coughs> it's not novel, but you just buy the product and you can use it. Um, but yeah, just Craigslist, and if you can do it locally, like if you're one space, I think is highly underrated. I don't know if anyone's running this, but. Internet of Things stroke hardware for small businesses. I grew up in a single unit restaurant. If you were doing like restaurants, you can probably go to a collection of restaurants in your local area and give them estimates or whatever you're doing. Um, so that's what we do. Hey Ben, I was just curious if you had considered going on a show like Shark Tank or something. Mm -hmm. They have been like hounding us oh. to go on Shark Tank. I think because they just love dogs, right? You gotta get a dog on the show. No, we have not. We've been really fortunate to have great venture backing from both traditional tech VCs um, as well as folks in pet, like you know, our individuals from Mars. And, um, it's an interesting show. I think it's a really good PR opportunity. But if you're able to get traditional capital here, I think they sometimes still look down upon it. So we like to not do it. Just on kind of the note of fundraising, if you're welcome to talk about it, what sure. was sort of your initial fundraising strategy? Was it always to go big, $10 million, and just have a big big spurt, or did you guys think of maybe more of a leaner startup type of methodology? Yeah, you know, we definitely, that we there? did. That wasn't all one round. So, I mean, so, in terms of the way we started, um, we always knew that for us to build the device we wanted to build, um, it was going to take capital. You have to understand what you're trying to build. And if you're going to, if you, if, Here's a great example of a company I respect a ton. They just raised their second round, but they were able to get somewhere far faster without uh, raising money. At, or there was a few million bucks, but smart things. For anyone who knows smart things. Yeah. Really cool company. And I love the guys. Like We'd love to work with them and do some work with them and so forth. They didn't really care about industrial design or consumer branding because of what they were bringing in terms of innovation was connecting your home. And their segment was a very, very open to that what I would call early adopter, almost geek audience, right? Like I'm like, I love data on my house, no matter what it looks like. At the time, smart things coming out with some pretty interesting wireless innovations. They didn't really care about the idea of the product. And they were able to get to, um, I'd say, interesting volume and interesting awareness without raising a lot of capital. For us, because we did believe that PetSmart was such an important channel for us, PetSmart and Petco, just national pet, as well as that the beauty of the device did matter and it had to actually be waterproof, it was tough to do that without some capital. Um, we definitely thought though about Kickstarter and Indiegogo and so forth. We just had some VCs that got really excited, so we were able to raise that capital instead. Uh, did you guys have any problems with regulations or IP issues as you were developing the device and or manufacturing China? Great question. Yeah, I know. We, um, uh, sort of two questions there. Yeah, we were, uh, regulation-wise, I mean, you go through FCC, CE, you go through certifications of wireless, which I can talk about, but it's very tactical for anyone. Um, we were very careful with IP overall and understanding where we stood in the landscape of devices that exist and devices that could exist and protecting, and we have several patents ourselves. If you've heard Tony Fidel talk about this, I've patented everything. We tried to hit that approach as much as we could afford it. Um, in terms of China, this goes back to the relationship thing. I mean, our 
manufacturing partner we do trust. Um, and so could our device, could our specs, could our firmware get out? Sure. The reality is that's not going to probably hurt your brand as much as you might think. I think everyone who's at a big company in this space, and we're not even a big company, but we're a medium-sized company. We have a clone in China, we have a clone in Brazil that has the exact same website, the exact same product. That's going to happen. Um, at first, you get really stressed about it. I was all freaked out when I saw it. And I was like, oh, no, it's a compliment. And it doesn't really impact your business materially, uh, at least not in the near term. So, this, so your, your device emits Wi-Fi radiation and emits Bluetooth. Did Are you going to the dog Bluetooth? cancer question? Say that again? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm always like, do you have a cell phone in your pocket? Um, yeah, I mean, so what was what were people's reactions about that? Because you know, it's 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 kind of a gut thing. You it's you can't totally. like, people are not engineers. You can't talk to them about BB. No, I, I joke about it only because <laughs> we we do hear about it. Um, the reality is, that most the vast majority of our consumers, even mass consumers who are not tech and not in this room, do understand that they have a cell phone in their pocket and they probably have a Bluetooth headset on, and this is not actually dangerous for their dog. The few who we do get, we actually went above and beyond, in part because we really do care about this stuff, but also because we just want to make sure we had an answer for them. So we did SARS testing, which isn't required for us, but it's required for human wearables. And SARS testing is a proxy for emissions. <coughs> um, we're actually a safe wearable for you to wear on your neck as a human being. And so we're able to tell that to, to owners who are concerned about that for their dog. It hasn't really come up as much as we expected, to be honest, but um, it's a good question. Have you seen, from the early data that you've captured, have you seen uh, a frequency of people actually going to the vet more often? It's a great question, and it's Banfield's billion dollar question, I think, in terms of how valuable we are to be a partner to their businesses, because one visit to the vet for a Banfield or VCA is worth way more than a whistle. Um, we have started to see early indicators of that. Uh, I don't think we've seen a statistically significant sample in terms of the owner who buys a whistle today is obviously pet health conscious already. And so, segment of that relative to the overall population, I think we need a couple of years of data to honestly see if their own rates uh, improve or increase. Uh, what we've done from a product perspective is you can, and this is about the habit formation, you try to help create those habits, you don't just let them be. Right. And so not just activity and rest, but if anyone, and I'm sure all of you dog owners are going to, when you buy the whistle, you'll see that we allow you to log medication and food and add reminders, which is really important for a multi-owner household. And so we think that'll probably increase, not only that, this is also compliance on things like flea and tick and pain medication. And can you categorize it by type of dog, size of dog, yeah. age of dog? We do um, age, weight, and breed. But then of course on the phone we get location, and then for most of our owners using Facebook, we get some owner demographics. Okay. Um, we never share those or anything, but we know what's going on in terms of who our owners are. So you're putting this product into large scale, and I was wondering, and you're a startup, you're a small company. So I was wondering how you manage the customer support, customer relationship. Great question. I should have brought John Craig. He would have loved to talk yeah, about this. We would have talked about it. He would be here all night. Um, we hired one incredible individual from Tesla. Um, Tesla was a pretty high-touch, high-end consumer product when they first had to support those cars, um, and still do, but certainly early on. He actually, prior to that, was at Sling. One of our lead investors is from Slingbox. And so he's had a lot of consumer experience. And he's really built an org that's quite flexible. So to answer your question in terms of our capital and our stage, we have one part-time resource, and then we have a firm, which is actually the same firm as a lot of the consumer electronics companies out here use, that you can flex basically up and down with volume as needed. Um, but day to day, he's, he's our only one in the office who's really on calls all day with consumers, and then folks outside the office he manages. What's the name of that firm? Uh, so we work with uh, Spot, keep the other in Austin. They work with Nest, and they're uh, they're great. How many people have the original blue log? We cycle through thousands of them. Yeah. I can't tell you at any given time how many there is. Any, you know, but we you have to get thousands of dogs. There's over 400 breeds of dog. So I'm just. A, that was more, again, for our own consumer research of interest, but we didn't want to get, we also wanted to see does this stuff work on a chihuahua like it does on a like, great day. And so we definitely want to get a significant sample versus doing like 10 or 15. And they're also cheap, by the way. These are like, cheap electronics. So how much do you spend by the time you got the blue water phase? Because they're, they're your phase and you haven't really, yeah, really policy. Not a lot, idea, right? not a lot. I mean, I, I have to look back at, very little. I mean, it was the founding team and folks who were working for virtually nothing. And then the blue loggers were, you know, 20 bucks per. So you're in the tens of thousands of dollars range. Are you 
can't give them an old pay for it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but even if we paid for it, I mean, you're not, I'm not saying it's not, it's a significant <coughs> sum of capital, but it's not like it was a lot of, it wasn't hundreds of thousands of dollars. Have savings from your previous jobs. <laughs> Yeah. Just, this might be off topic. So how do you build mixed breeds? Because <laughs> yeah, yeah, I haven't much. No, it's not off topic at all. This is me off. You know, it's like it's not something we can solve a whistle. But you want to know exactly how Duke, my dog, compare in these half Dachshund, quarter Jack, and all that stuff. Um, so over time, we'll hopefully get really, really refined and allow you to offer a master breed. Like for Duke, that'll be a dog. He's a Dachshund Terrier mix. But today we do mixed breed based on age, gender. That was one other one I forgot to mention, um, and weight. It's a pretty good proxy. It's not perfect, but that's what we do today. Did you ever find a correlation between, say, if it's 50 percent something, and then I'm not a dog person, so I don't know how to do. So we don't even collect that data today in okay. terms of the mutt. So we don't know. Like, so I don't tell Whistle that Duke's a dog's and terrier mix. I just say he's a mutt that is 17 pounds on when he's soaking wet. Uh, are you enabling any uh, social networking? So for all the owners, they can network with each other and. If you want to. Yeah. It's a great question. So I'm going to pull in our head of product for me to talk about it. Um, yeah, great question. So we think about social as enabling uh, really our core experience, right? So our core experience is something that Ben talked about pretty early on, which is around habit formation. Ultimately, our goal and our mission is uh, we're a pet company. We believe in sort of the power of people, of people having uh, you know pets and the relationships that that, you know, that requires, yeah. right? The the care and the time and attention, and we just want you to spend more time with your pet, go outside more. We have a lot of people who write into us and say, I've been spending more time with my dog as a result of whistle, I'm healthier, they're healthier. And ultimately, we want to build anything that enables that. So whether that's entering in different medications and reminders around medication and going to the vet more, or if it's just get outside more, or hey, maybe it means meet other dog owners, learn more about your specific dog, whether it's we're pushing content to you or we're pushing who are those other similar dogs we are comparing you to. Right now, we actually don't even show you who the other dogs are. Uh, that was for very practical reasons. When you're you know, selling your very first unit, there's probably not a lot of similar dogs out there, right? Outside of data that we capture with our Duke Blue data loggers, right? So as that community is growing, we're, wanna, you know, we're gonna wanna show you exactly who those other dogs are, allow you to connect with other, other dogs. I mean, I don't think we wanna ever build Facebook for dogs, and that's not our <laughs> end goal, right? Uh, it all comes back to that very, very simple mission. Uh, Oh, thanks guys. Thanks for listening. All right, a round of applause for Matt.